Hello there, YouTube. Devin here again. And uh, today uh, is going to be a video on a question that was posed to me uh, the other day um, about how the souls on military boots and everything have kind of changed throughout the ages and some of the pros and cons to them and stuff like that. So we're going to we're going to start pretty pretty early on um with how souls would have been way back before Roman times pretty much. Um they would have been just basically flat rubber. You would uh, not rubber, I mean leather. There wouldn't have been any specific style um or anything or shape to them. Uh, shoes would have been reserved for the incredibly wealthy. Most people would have probably been wearing sandals, uh, which are, you know, save a lot of resources and materials, uh, cause leather can be quite hard to work with back in the day. And then you would put those over foot wraps if you were in a cold environment, or sometimes you would even wrap furs over your sandals. So it's just, um, but as far as like modern era goes, uh, these haven't really uh, existed much since, like, the mid-1800s. Um, you see smooth leather shoes through the American Civil War and uh, through the uh, Franco-Prussian War and stuff like that um, in some degree. Uh, but pretty much by the, the 1870s, they're, they're gone. Um, you, you really don't see smooth leather sold uh, combat material after that now um these have rubber heels on them but uh that's that's just because these are pretty new but this is a pretty good representation of what you would have found uh up before like the 1870s of what combat boots would have been it would have been a stitched leather sole uh, of probably pretty thick leather and that would be about it that's all you would have and these have a lot of problems they slip when it's wet um they do get more grip, though, as you wear them because the leather starts to wear out and gets all these little dings and scuffs and, and roughs up and stuff, and that gives you more grip as you go, but that also means the leather is wearing out, and the, the, shoes, would have to be, the shoes and boots would have to be resold quite often and have new leather put on them, which means they would be slippery again, and that's just not very cost-effective to be replacing the soldier's shoes every six months to a year because of all the marching and stuff they're doing in them and wearing them out. That's just not a cost-effective idea. So the next, the next upgrade to the smooth leather soles um, would have been to, to hobnail uh, the soles. Now, hobnailing is basically you take that same leather sole and you put all these kind of cast iron nails in them and what that does is it for one it gives you more grip all right so you have these studs now to catch in the ground uh these don't do so well on pavement or uh tile or anything like that but as far as like outdoor ground goes where the soldier is most of the time hobnails are going to help you out a lot with your grip um and they also uh have the uh added benefit of iron being much stronger than leather, uh, you now have to wear through these studs walking uh, before you start to, to hurt the leather. So it's much easier, you know, every year or, you know, so to pry the nails out and pound new nails in rather than replacing the soles because pretty much anyone can pound new nails in and screw in new heel uh, plates and toe plates with very little regard. And you see these appear a lot in the late 1870s, early uh, uh, 1880s. You see a lot of armies transition to hobnailed soles. Pretty much universally, hobnails become the way to go. And because it, it extended the life of the boot pretty much indefinitely as long as you kept replacing the nails, it would take much, much longer to, to wear the soles out. And um, the, like, these do have some negatives though that came later they're very loud so if you're marching on pavement these crunch really really loud they have that kind of trademark crunch noise of the gravel being smashed out of the way by the the cast iron nails and so they're very very loud in pavement um 
or like on some kind of dirt roads where they're they're very packed or cobblestone or you know indoors they're 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 very slippery as well more slippery than just leather the hobnails are on like a polished wood floor or something which was pretty common back in the day um these would be very slippery on so and from there uh we went uh, to kind of more elaborate hobnail setups uh, to protect the edge of the boot and stuff like that. So you see uh, kind of this style come along. Um, where you see they still... Uh, the hobnails kind of wrap around to protect the edge of the boot as well. Um, that's just a different design for a different purpose. It wasn't really suited for everybody. But these did come later than just hobnails being driven into the bottom. Now, the first army to ever issue hobnailed... Uh, footwear to their military was actually the Roman army. Way, way back in the day, they would put uh, iron studs in the bottom of their uh, sandals. Um, their caligae, uh, as they were known. Um, so I could be butchering that. I don't speak any Roman. Um, uh, sorry, Latin. My bad. I don't speak any Latin. But uh, so, but it became really, it was a lost thing uh, after the Roman times, and it basically became standard again, uh, late uh 19th century so um and then from there hobnails were pretty much used up through world war ii by a vast majority of armies and sometimes well into the 50s and 60s um after that rubber became more available and now as you can see here this basically goes back to the same thing uh, as before as with the leather soles but now instead of having you would normally uh, do this like you see you see there's a couple layers of leather in there so instead of having just three or four layers of leather they would do like two layers of leather and to that they would just stitch rubber now instead of another extra thick layer of leather um, which works out quite well uh rubber gives you good traction it's quiet it's good flexibility it's got good uh hot and cold insulation the hobnails uh standing on them because they went up through pretty much the to the inside or through to the inside of the boot would transfer hot and cold so like if you're a sentry and you're, those nails are standing on ice that temperature is going to transfer up the the iron into your foot uh basically into the inside of the boot which is bad because that cold and heat transfer if you're standing on like a fire in a battlefield you know the battlefield was just shelled and it's very hot you know where there was incendiaries everywhere that heat is going to transfer through your hobnails into your boot and the rubber doesn't do that um, the rubber also provides a very very good amount of grip and uh they last uh certain kinds of rubber that are very very hard uh, would last very long, but uh, early kinds of rubber that you see like with the American boots in World War II were made out of natural rubber, and uh, while they provided good grip and, you know, good cushion and support and everything, they did tend to wear out faster than hobnails did. But the thing is, they also um, were much more cost-effective than the... Uh, maintenance on the, on the hobnails and everything like that the the benefits to the americans outweighed outweighed the cons so the iron being a precious um, metal needed for wartime supplies and steel and stuff so rubber was kind of the way to go so it's it's a lot of personal preference whereas you see germans using hobnails right through world war ii because that's what they had access to and that's what they knew worked and they've been using it for once world war ii came about basically for the last almost you know better part of a century so but as you can see they kind of downstepped and went to rubber soles basically same technology that was used way back in the mid 1800s just to but now with the bottom layer being rubber and the as you can see it must have worked out pretty well because most shoes today i have rubber soles and uh so now we're going to move on to some of the better attachment methods uh to rubber soles because stitching is a time uh time uh timely sorry ca uh, expensive way to uh attach soles and uh while they are replaceable training people and it's in you know is a labor intensive process and the cost of training that person to do it is you know very expensive as well rather than now they wanted to make boots kind of more cheaper and kind of disposable and 
everything like that. So they moved on to some other attachment methods rather than just glue and stitching. You see a lot of uh, countries transition to, to nails, nailing in the sole as well as to being stitched because the stitching, if the stitching came undone, your sole would start to peel off. So they would start stitching and gluing and then nailing the soles together until the rubber technology got better and that's what they would roll with and it, you know that became more cost effective because now you have to add nails to take care of this uh to make sure your stole stays on instead of peeling away because the rubber was a little bit different than the leather and the glue and the heat and everything like that leather expands and contracts and hardens and softens with heat and temperature and that would affect the gluing process and everything like that and your sole would you know with natural wear would peel off because it was uh, a different material than the leather, so it would separate. And that's how they ended up having to go to, to nailed soles, kind of like this, uh, stitched, glued, and nailed soles. Eventually, after that, we get to the very, very end of the whole entire process, and you get to direct molded, which is now they make the uppers of the boot, and then they spray a bunch of hot vulcanized rubber into a mold that's in this shape this tread pattern and then they take the upper of the boot on a big hydraulic press and they smash it down into this mold and they they hold it there and heat it up and squish it real real hard and then they cool it off and they pull it out and the sole is permanently attached and affixed to the boot now that became a very cost effective cheap because the rubber essentially fused to the leather you didn't need to glue it, you didn't need to stitch it, you didn't need anything. It essentially just f it covered, went over and around and under and fused to the leather. And this became the standard and is still the standard for combat boots today. You still see some stitch designs that are reinforced, but for the most part, most major armies are using a direct molded sole design because it's cheap and cost effective. Um, to make the boot the very first time, but the thing is, after the boots, you know, the soles have reached their lifespan and everything like that, they, you can replace the soles on them, but now it has become much more cheaper to just get a new pair of boots rather than try to resole a direct molded uh, sole pair of boots. And so this is kind of now the standard. You get one of these, you wear them till you can't anymore, until they basically become ineffective and fall apart, and then you get a new pair, because it's more cost-effective to do that. And then the leather, uh, the leather designs have been tr tweaked and stuff to suit environments and different water types and temperatures, and the rubber's been kind of tweaked for that as well, depending on what, you know, you're operating in and the temperatures and the environments and everything like that. Uh, but this has kind of become the standard because not only is this not susceptible to to uh, slipping and stuff like that or to uh, water like leather is uh, or or stitching. There's no stitching to wear out from grit or anything like that. Uh, getting into the stitching and that fine abrasives and sand and stuff eventually, you know, cutting away at the, the fibers of the thread holding the soles together. There's nothing, there's no layers to peel apart. There's there's nothing to really go wrong with the sole, except sometimes the leather will separate from the sole, but that takes usually a lot to do with direct molded sole boots. Um, unless you get a defective pair, most direct molded sole boots, the sole is going to stay firmly attached until you until basically the boot falls apart or the sole is worn down to be completely flat and you start slipping on everything. So, but that's basically the, the evolution of military boots, the soles and stuff like that. And so basically you went from, from smooth leather like this 150 years ago to, to this. You can see the difference and the, the advance and everything like that. And there, there's just so much that has changed so much you can do and so many different variations and all these you know aren't exactly hard lines and dates different armies used different different types of you know had their reasonings for staying with one kind or, or moving to a different kind or another but this is just kind of a generalization so please don't get mad at me based on based on the times and dates i'm going when most armies transitioned when when everything uh tended to happen kind of in a big group when there was kind of a mass exodus away from one thing to another thing. I'm not saying that was genuinely for everybody, but hopefully this answers that uh, particular viewer's questions and uh, some of the different pros and cons and everything to each soul. And I 
by no means covered all of the pros and cons to each soul. It, uh, it very much depends on your environment and where you live and, you know, the era and stuff like that as to what would be best uh, at the time. So, but hopefully you guys like this video and you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. Uh, I hope I covered something that hasn't really been covered. Um, it was a very good question. It made it got me thinking, so I figured I'd put it out there for you guys as well. And hopefully, you like the sort of thing and you subscribe. If you do, uh, please keep comments on topic. But if you do have any comments or suggestions for future videos or anything like that, um, please uh, leave me a thing in the comments. I do my best to reply to all of them or at least like all of your comments. Um, so thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.